Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And as you said today, I will give a talk on modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, actually about preventing or postponing dementia. To be honest, I was never really interested into preventive strategies. I was always more into neurobiology, molecular mechanisms, and maybe treatment. But uh, living in a world uh, facing um, pandemic of out of infectious disease and knowing that actually we are waiting for another epidemic in the next 30 years uh, gives a good reason to talk about preventive strategies. As you all know, by the year of uh, 2050, the number of people living with dementia will actually triple. And we should start now with preventive strategies in order not to have these numbers. Uh, this is the price we are paying uh, about um, the longevity. But the question rising here is actually, does it mean that everyone that lives too long will have dementia? Of course not. Alzheimer's disease is not an inevitable consequence of aging. And there is a very interesting, not very new population-based clinical pathological study that actually revealed that uh, even 50% out of the non-demented, uh, very old people do have a pathology in the brain, but are actually not demented. So the question rising here now, is this only a prodromal stage of Alzheimer's disease or maybe a resilience, or how to explain why someone who is amyloid positive is cognitively normal? Uh, we have to look beyond or behind amyloid. It is the amyloid cascade hypothesis that has long been the one trying to explain why someone gets the disease and the other is not. And if we want to put things very simple, and clear, we say that it is because of a genetic susceptibility, very rare genetic forms uh, of familiar uh, disease, and an interplay among risk factors that give vulnerability and protective factors that give the resilience. And their interplay defines one's brain and cognitive reserve. At one point in life, it's either increased amyloid beta production that starts and it is uh, for the genetic forms of the disease or what is more common in sporadic forms we have decreased amyloid uh, beta clearance. And this amyloid changes its form and clumps into insoluble aggregates how becomes phosphorylated, widespread brain neuroinflammation starts and oxidative stress, and we have the main histopathological signs of the disease, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. The clinical symptoms arise and the brain volume and atrophy occurs. This is the very simplified story of how Alzheimer's disease arises in one's brain. But I think what we uh, probably forget is to, to stay curious and ask questions just like children do. This happened to me when my daughter uh, accidentally heard one of my talks and she said, okay, I understand that there are amyloid plaques, but could you give me a very simple explanation why is this happening in the brain? What makes amyloid do this? Of course, I could not give her the answer, otherwise I would get the Nobel Prize probably. But that was really a good question that leads us to maybe something that we are missing in the puzzle, the function of mitochondria. And maybe the amyloid cascade is not wrong, of course, but uh, it is just the end stage of the story. It is like we are watching a TV series and we start with episode one out of uh, season 10 and we skip everything that is before. So uh, the focus on mitochondria leads us to the mitochondrial cascade hypothesis. And in this cascade, the energy hypermetabolism is the one that plays the primary role especially in the sporadic, the most common form of Alzheimer's disease. So we can talk about hypermetabolism first biomarker instead of amyloid first biomarker. And what I would like you to remember out of this mitochondrial cascade hypothesis is this, that the mitochondrial decline rate can be both genetically, but what is more important for us today is that it can be environmentally determined. Uh, 
So we can just put things very simple. What is good for the mitochondria is good for the brain. If we look uh, into the mitochondria, this represents the inside, let's say, um, scheme of the mitochondria. In a brain that has Alzheimer's disease pathology, we can see that the antioxidant capacity is decreased. The mitochondrial DNA mutations are increased. The apoptotic markers are increased. And of course, the biogenesis is decreased. And what can a physical exercise do in the mitochondria? Everything that is opposite from Alzheimer's disease pathology. Increase antioxidant capacity, decrease mutations, decrease apoptotic biomarkers, and of course, increase biogenesis. So this gives a new hope. And especially if you can see on this also simplified scheme, that all the vascular known risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, uh, hypercholesterolemia or dyslipidemia actually influence the mitochondrial function and increase the reactive oxidant species. And this, I can say, can be a light at the end of the road and gives a different perspective and actually was the reason why I got interested into modifiable risk factors. There is another reason I have to share with you. We did a study among the uh, patients from our outpatient clinic in the two-year period, and we realized that we have really young people living in dementia in North Macedonia. So 23% um, of 144 patients had the disease on the dementia onset before the age of 65. That was much higher percentage than the, the one we know, 5% out of all uh, Alzheimer's disease cases. Uh, we thought it might be that the younger uh, people are referred to the tertiary level. We also checked for the genetics, and in fact, we found a new mutation in APP gene. But of course, genetics would not be the explanation for this percentage. We had to look into the protective and risk factors, actually the environmental, lifestyle, and psychosocial factors. In the last decade, numbers of papers have been published identifying more or less seven to nine risk factors you all know as vascular risk factors um, that were involved in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. But these studies also show that only 10 to 25% reduction in these seven factors could potentially prevent millions, up to 3 million cases worldwide. We checked these factors into our cohort, and as expectedly, we, we found most of them identified as risk factors or predictors for Alzheimer's disease with different odds ratios, but what was strikingly high was the education lower than nine years. This increased the risk for Alzheimer's disease development up to eightfold. This was something that uh, we were surprised by, but actually there are studies that say that uh, up to 6.5 million cases of Alzheimer's disease worldwide are potentially attributable to low education attainment. So brain and cognitive reserve, cardiovascular health with high education and social engaging activities are the ones we should focus on. Of course, we found that physical activity acts as protective factor, and as studies suggest, 25% reduction in physical inactivity prevalence could potentially prevent nearly 1 million of the cases of Alzheimer's disease, even in those that have genetic uh, susceptibility or high risk for dementia like APOE4. And of course, at the same beginning, I stress the connection between physical activity and mitochondria. So we asked this a very simple question. Uh, could it be that our patients actually had very low brain or cognitive reserve and could not tolerate the Alzheimer's disease pathology burden that led to an earlier dementia manifestation? Yes, that can be the answer as Jack suggested in this dynamic biomarker. 
changes in the brain. If we say that 65 is the fixed stage where dementia occurs, these can roll on the axis of age to the left if there are comorbidities or genetic susceptibility, amplification uh, genes that can lead to an earlier disease onset, or those who have enhanced cognitive or brain reserve could have a delayed dementia onset. So this leads uh, actually to my point that we can prevent both Alzheimer's disease, but at least what we can do is to delay dementia. And if there is something good about this disease is the long uh, development of the neuropathology in the brain. It takes up to 20 years until the first symptoms of dementia occur. And if we present the Alzheimer's disease as an iceberg, uh, dementia is just the peak of this iceberg, and that is actually what gives burden to people living with dementia and their families. When they are asymptomatic, they don't even know that they have the disease. If we design preventive strategies, we have to identify the risk and protective factors and start with primary prevention that would include the whole population. But what is even more important, we might have people with the disease that has already started in the brain under the surface of this water. We can delay the dementia onset and give them quality of life. So if you ask me, does uh, pre uh, prevention of Alzheimer's disease make sense? Of course, because as studies suggest, delaying onset just by five years will decrease the disease prevalence in the 2050 by 44%. And those are, if we uh, convert into numbers, million of people living without dementia. Plus, we still do not have the cure for Alzheimer's disease. We don't have magic bullets. And another argument plus is that we already have studies that suggest, like the finger study, the most famous one, that a multi-domain intervention could improve or at least maintain cognitive functioning in elderly people that are at risk, that have the risk factors. If we start with preventive strategies now, maybe by the year of 2020, we will have people living with Alzheimer's disease but without the dementia stage that you can admit is something we can do. And the difficult question is where to begin. Who should we target? Maybe those that have subjective cognitive decline, a new concept that has been evolving for the past couple of years, or those that have family history of dementia. Uh, this is a very interesting composite risk factor that both has genetic risk factors included, but also the lifestyle we take up from the family we've been brought up, the way we have attitudes towards physical activity, uh, the food we, we take, uh, the stimulation of the brain in early childhood. So this is a very complex and composite risk factor. In our group, uh, adult children of people that uh, had Alzheimer's disease had a higher percentage of APOE4 allele. But um, as you can see in this study below, high education, maintenance of vascular health could be beneficial and lower the risk for Alzheimer's disease development, particularly in those that have the APOE4 allele as a risk factor. We checked uh, the adult children study for the modifiable risk factors. And what we found was surprisingly higher education in the children of our dementia patients. Almost half of them had higher education than 16 years, which is good. But on the other hand, only one third of them had regular physical activity and almost half of them did not have hobbies or social engagement. And this is a very simple and good starting point uh, that does not need a lot of financial support nor uh, higher academic science. 
Only two months ago, the Lancet Commission updated the previous, so the one of 2017 report on dementia prevention, and actually designed this very interesting life course model. I believe you've already seen it. Um, the difference is that we, uh, before we actually stress that it is the midlife interventions that are important. This model suggests that we should start from the early life uh, with education to enhance cognitive reserve. Of course, the most risk factors are should be modified during midlife, but it's never too late to start modification. So even in later life, we can prevent at least some percent of the people living with uh, dementia. Uh, on the previous nine risk factors, they included three new. Uh, very interesting, air pollution. I must say I excluded this factor from our study because everyone were uh, exposed to air pollution, so we could not do statistics. And uh, it was not listed in the previous uh, risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. They included higher alcohol intake, and traumatic brain injury. Some of these factors, I would not go into details, reduce neuropathological damage. Some of them increase and maintain cognitive reserve, both lead to preventing dementia. And just an idea I would like to share with you and maybe discuss with, uh, with you later is that uh, North Macedonia is not Sweden, nor Japan, nor United States, nor New Zealand. So I believe that every country should do a study of its own to identify the dominant risk and predictive factors for Alzheimer's disease that have original signature for that population and that country and to design the preventive strategy and public health policy according to the results. Of course, design a risk screening tool, identify individuals at risk and design a prevention multi-domain intervention and then follow up. Hopefully they will not develop into dementia state, but of course to follow up, we need the biomarkers. I'm eager to wait for Marina's talk, blood preferably, cognitive and genetic maybe risk for stratification. And then to have as early diagnosis as possible that would lead us to the treatment. But when we talk about treatment, it's a story and chapter of its own. Probably we will have precision medicine, very individualized designed cocktail treatments um, designed by the underlying pathology, because as things are developing, probably just like dementia, Alzheimer's disease is a syndrome and maybe on the next meeting, we'll talk about Alzheimer's diseases each of them with different neuropathology, um, proteinopathy overlap, and different etiopathological mechanisms. Some have neuroinflammation as dominant, some would have neurodegeneration as dominant um, neuropathological mechanisms. But what is sure that all neurodegenerative disorders share something that is common and that is mitochondria dysfunction. And maybe, I just say maybe, uh, it is too early. Uh, if we find a way to keep mitochondria viable and stable during the process of aging, we would find a universal cure for the neurodegenerative disorders in all. Till then, we can modify the risk factors that we know that influence the mitochondrial health. Thank you.